team. I'd ask you this morning to take your Bibles out and open them up to the book of Job. The book of Job. We continue considering this theme of fearless. Title of this message this morning is Fearless. The righteous are as bold as a lion. That's in the book of Proverbs. Our title for this morning is Don't Be Afraid to Hope. When there is no hope, when it feels like all hope is lost, don't be afraid to hope. Your Bible's open to Job. Find the 13th chapter, Job chapter 13. We'll read there in verse 15 in just a moment. Our hearts have all um, been touched this week. Um, One of our favorite first ladies uh, has passed away. Um, I have always considered uh, Miss Barbara Bush an elegant uh, lady. Uh, I've admired her, her spirit, her presence, uh, her, her very wry uh, grin. Uh, I, I thought that picture right there was a, a perfect depiction of her in my mind of understanding her character and her personality. I learned some things about her this week. Maybe you did too. I, I did not realize that uh, Miss Bush and President Bush had a daughter. I didn't know about their daughter, Robin. Maybe you've read about this. I I had not. Uh, Their daughter, Robin, was born um, just a few years after uh, George W. was born. Uh, They had Robin because uh, they said that that George W. needed a companion. But at a very young age, Robin began to have this mysterious bruising that took her to the pediatrician leading pediatrician there in Midland, did several blood tests, came back with white blood cell count that was through the roof. They said they'd never seen a white blood cell count so high. Of course, that led to a diagnosis of leukemia. And the doctor's recommendation to Mr. and Mrs. Bush were just to take Robin home and and let nature take its course. Well, they wouldn't do that. They didn't want to do that. And so they, they took her to New York to some friends that they had there. And the doctors began to treat her for cancer, doing blood transfusion, bone marrow tests, all those things. Those, that testing eventually turned against Robin's body and she slipped into a coma. They called for H.W., George H.W. Bush to come from Midland. He flew to be there. And as he flew... Robin had slipped into a coma and died peacefully soon after. In an interview in 2012, Mrs. Bush said these words, I truly felt her soul go out of that beautiful little body, she wrote. For one last time, I combed her hair. And we held our precious little girl. And then she said this, I have never felt the presence of God more strongly than at that moment. I think it would come as no surprise to learn that Mrs. Bush's secret service code name was tranquility. I think that tranquility came as a result of her deep abiding faith in God. Even in the most difficult days. And so today I want to talk about hope in the midst of suffering. Where do we turn? Where do we run? What is happening in the midst of our suffering? Hope in, the midst, hope in God in the midst of our suffering stimulates the deepening of faith in the character and the purpose of God. There is no better place for us to turn than to the book of Job. We just sang of ancient words. There may not be any more ancient words than these words that are written in the book of Job. We don't know who wrote these words. We don't know when. We don't know where they were written. We know that they are ancient. We know that they are quoted in the epistles of Paul. We know that James implores us, recommends to us the steadfastness of Job. We know that this story is 
powerful. And so without any further hesitation, let me ask you to stand with me in honor of God's word. And if you're able, and we'll read here Job 13 and verse 15 with your Bibles in your hands, with your phone app open, whatever you've got, let's remind ourselves, repeat after me, this is the word of God for the people of God to know the will of God and to do it. Job says, though he slay me, yet I will hope in him. Yet I will argue my ways to his face. Father, help us in these few moments that we have to unpack these, this beautiful theme, Father, of your presence in suffering. God, may we not lose sight of the struggle here, and may we move forward today hoping in you, especially in our suffering. God, we thank you that you are closest to us in our most painful moments, even when it seems hardest to hear. Even when it feels distant, God, help us to hope in you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray these things together. And God's people say, amen. And so I, I want to direct your attention. I'm, 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 I'm feeding back this morning on a, a message, or this week, on a message that I heard two years ago at a preaching conference that made such a deep impact in my life um, that I, I listened to it again twice this week. Um, I dug back into the text and into uh, the writings that were referred to, and uh, just such a blessing to me. And, and the outline from that message two years ago, I'm just going to use that skeleton for us this morning. The outline very simply today is Job's Lament. Job's friends, and Job's God. And so obviously there are 42 chapters. We're not going to be in all 42 chapters. We'll refer to many of them. And so keep your Bibles open. I hope your worship folder is open to the outline so that you can follow along, make some notes as we move through this time of considering, first of all, Job's lament. Job is a, a man who was considered in Job chapter 1 a, a man who is righteous. There's no one in the east, no man in the east who is like him. And for his greatness, for his uniqueness, he is seen as fit to afflict with great suffering. In Job chapter 1, we read quickly, beginning in verse 14 and 15. Now, now let me say we're going to get to uh, your questions about this heavenly scene. That it's the first part of Job chapter 1. Where there is a, a, a meeting of, of heaven's host there and Satan, after God says, have you considered my servant Job? And Satan says, he only, he only follows you because you do good for him, because you bless him. And then God in chapter 1 and again in chapter 2 gives permission, permits the adversary, the accuser Satan, to afflict Job. Those afflictions come hard and fast. Job chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, a messenger shows up on Job's doorstep and tells him that the neighboring people, the Sabians, have stolen all the oxen and the donkeys and killed all the servants who tended to them. As he was speaking, messenger number 2 shows up and says to Job, fire, the fire of God has fallen, probably lightning, and burned all up all the sheep and the servants tending to them. As he was speaking, messenger number three shows up, says the Chaldeans have stolen all your camels and killed all the servants tending to them. As he is speaking, messenger number four shows up, and in verses 18 and 19 of Job chapter one says, all 10 of your children were gathered together, sharing a meal, and a great wind blew, and the house collapsed, killing all of them. All that Job had was gone. Everything. In chapter 2, we see these incredible events 
stockpiling themselves on top of one another. And then a new affliction occurs. Satan says to God, he only loves you because you haven't harmed his body physically. He still has his health. And God says, you can touch his body, but you may not kill him. And we are told in Job chapter 2, verse 7, that Job is struck with loathsome sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head, deep, open, gaping wounds. Job takes a broken piece of pottery and scrapes the secretions off of his body. It is horrible. But in Job's sufferings, I want you to see his blameless proclamations. Now, this is huge for us. In the midst of our suffering, how will we respond? Look at Job chapter 1. Look at verse 20. Job arose and tore his robe, a sign of mourning, shaved his head and fell on the ground. And he did what? Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord has given, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Then the author tells us that in doing this and all this, Job did not sin or charge, or charge God with wrong. Chapter 2, his body is afflicted from the soles of his feet to the top crown of his head. And he says there in Job chapter 2, in verse 10, he says... His wife says, do you still hold fast to your integrity? In verse 10, curse God and die. He said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women. Almost saying, that's not who we are. You're speaking as the foolish people speak. Shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? And all this Job did not sin with his lips. Friends, We do not have time in this message to deal with this issue. But let me say clearly, we only need to read Job's words to know how to deal with evil in our lives and in this world. Shall we receive good from God and not evil? The Lord gives. The Lord takes away. We know Satan was the instrument, but in Job's mind, in his heart, in his relationship with God, it was the Lord who had done these things. These proclamations are blameless. Three friends show up, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. They gather around their friend Job, and they are silent for a week. For a week. They just sat together. Now, let me say at this moment, that was the best thing those three men ever did, was be quiet. Some of us and the sufferings of our friends and the sufferings of our family need to be quiet. Just sit. Just listen. It is okay to not have all the answers. It is all right to just cry together. Sometimes the best thing we can do is to be quiet. Job chapter 3, Job opens his mouth. Now after this week and some period of time, more than likely, Job, the sorrow begins to set in. We even feel the struggle in Job's words in Job 13, 15, right? Though you slay me, yet I will trust in you, yet I will argue my ways before your face. Job is struggling with what's happening, even though he attributes it from God And in Job chapter 3, I want to read to you just a few of these verses here, beginning in verse 1 or verse 3. It says, Job says, let the day perish on which I was born, and the night that said a man is conceived, let that day be darkness. May God above not seek it, nor light shine upon it. Let gloom and deep darkness claim it. Let clouds dwell upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. That night, let thick darkness seize it. Let it not rejoice among the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of the months. In other words, why was I ever born? Verse 11, why did I not die at birth? Why did I come out from the womb and expire? Verse 16, or why was I not as a hidden stillborn child, as infants who never see the light? Verse 23, 
Why is light given to a man whose way is hidden, whom God has hedged in? For my sighing comes instead of my bread, and my groanings are poured out like water. For the thing that I fear has come upon me, and what I dread befalls me. Look at verse 26. This is so powerful, intimate, transparent words. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, but trouble comes. There's a, a Twitter a tweet out on Twitterverse, and the title of the, of the tweet just says, are you kidding me? And then the explanation below is, Job reading social media postings of people's complaints. <laughs> but the reality is we've all had an are you kidding me day or moment or season in our life, right? And so here Job teaches us that it's okay to lay these things out before the Lord. It is all right. And so in Job's lament here, we see his sufferings. We see his bold, blameless proclamations. We see his sorrow. And now we hear his friends begin to speak in verses 4 all the way through verse 37. And his, his friends speak to him. There are three of them that speak through, verse, through chapter 31. Bildad, Eliphaz, and Zophar. They go in cycles. Eliphaz speaks, then Job responds. Bildad speaks, then Job responds. Zophar speaks, then Job responds. There are almost three complete cycles of that interaction. And then in verse 32, a young man shows up. His name is, his name is Elihu, and he speaks wisdom to his elders. But these three friends do a lot of damage, and they'd have been better off, as we said just a moment ago, to stay quiet. And their basic error is this. Bad things do not happen to good people. That's what they told Job over and over and over again. Even, this is, this is terrible. Even to the point of saying, Job, I mean, surely your kids weren't perfect. They must have done something to deserve what happened to them. I mean, how, how awful. Wouldn't they have been better to shut up and be quiet? How terrible a statement. That kind, of, that, that kind of proclamation is in error. These men were trapped in their orthodox patterns of thinking that God repays with blessing the righteous and he punishes with curses the unrighteous. And so, Job, these terrible things have happened to you. You must be unrighteous. But we know that's not true because in Job chapter 1, we are told from God's own mouth, he is a blameless, upright man. There is none like him in all of the east. And so these men do four things wrong. I want to show you this list because I want you to see, can we throw that list up there? The errors of Job's friends. There are four things here. I want you to grab a hold of these four things. I want you to fill in these blanks and not do these things. This comes from a commentary written by Derek Kidner. It says, the four mistakes are there. They overestimate their grasp of the truth. They assume they know and understand all the workings of God. Then they misapply the truth they think they know. And in doing so, they misrepresent God and they misjudge their friend. Friends, sometimes when you're tempted to speak in the midst of someone's suffering, Hold your tongue. Make sure you're not overestimating the truth and then misapplying the truth that you think you know and therefore misrepresent God and misjudge your friend. Job's friends were not so great of friends at all. But maybe the highlight of this book is Job's God. As a matter of fact, the commentators tell us that the the book of Job is not fundamentally about suffering. The book of Job is fundamentally about God. Job did not sin and therefore bring upon this suffering. And so Job's suffering was not caused by his sin. But in his sin, he did suffer. Now, he was provoked. His friends kept saying, Job, you must have done something. You must have done something. Come on, Job. Let it all out. And Job kept saying, I don't know. I, I, don't, I can't think of anything. I, didn't, I don't know what I did. I don't think I've done anything. And then he began to double down on that. And he began to say, I'm righteous. And, and then he began to 
clench his fist, and then he began to shake his fist at heaven, and, and then he demanded an audience with God. I want to plead my case. I'm going to argue my ways, verse 15 of chapter 13, before God. And so even though he did not suffer because he sinned in his suffering, he began to sin because he found fault with God. He found fault with the ways of God. He found fault with the purposes of God. He found fault in his God whom he loved. And so God speaks in Job chapter 38 through Job chapter 42. God speaks to Job. Verse, verses 2 and 3, God speaks to Job, and he says, Who is it, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you make it known to me. And so then we have four chapters of God taking Job on a tour of the natural world, of natural phenomenon, of earthquakes. He's speaking to him out of a firestorm, right? Humbling Job. And he takes him on this tour of the natural world of earthquakes and lightning and snowstorms and floods and waters and creation. Job, where were you when I laid out the boundaries of the seas? Where, where, where are the storehouses of snow and rain, Job? Where does the lightning come from, Job? Answer me. And then he takes him on this tour of the animal kingdom. They take a trip to the zoo, right? And Job is asked over and over again, or, rec or commended, consider these different animals and, and their behaviors. Job, do you understand these things? Who tells these animals where to abide and where to live and where to find habitat and Find their home. Who tells these and Job, consider these things. Job, answer me. Job, do you understand? Job, do you know? God speaks to Job in a way that completely humbles Job. Now, you'll notice in all of these verses, Job chapter 38 through 42, as God is speaking to Job, there is no explanation. None. Job does not hear God say, now that I've got your attention, let me tell you what I've been up to. He doesn't say that at all. But Job understands that he needs to repent of charging God of doing wrong, of questioning the purposes and the character of God. In verses 42, in chapter 42, verses 4 through 6, Job sees God and is satisfied. Job responds to God's questioning. In verse 5, he says, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear. But now my eye sees you. I've heard of you with my ears, but now I see you. You see, what Job sees clearly at the end of this writing is that he doesn't see clearly. There are things he cannot understand. And yet that does not drive him away from God. That drives him to God. Remember, we fight fear of this world and of man with the fear of the Lord. Job comes running into the presence of God and said, I've heard about you all my life with my ears, but now with my eye, I see you. I see you. This repentance leads to a great reversal of fortune. God restores Job. And you say, well, is that always going to happen? Is God always going to restore what he's taken away? No. That is not what always happens. And notice that Job repents before there's any restoration. Job does not repent because God has made this promise to restore. He repents because he's been in the presence of God and in the face of his character and his purpose. Job says, 
you were right all along and I was wrong. Job says, I'd heard of you with my ear, but now my eye sees you. What Job comes to see clearly is that he cannot see clearly. And so what do we take home from this brief summary of the book of Job? We take home three truths. First of all, God never fails. Amen? God never fails. In his timing, in his purpose, he never fails. I was reading through the book of Job with a, a group of guys that, that had never really read the Bible before. Some of them didn't know the Lord. And they came back from reading, I, I assigned them to read Job 38 through 41, and they came back and said, God is arrogant. He's conceited. Well, I can understand how you would think that if you, if you read that without knowing that God cannot be arrogant in a sinful way or conceited in a sinful way. It's impossible. God never fails, and his character and his purpose is immutable. It is unchanging. So we can say with the writer of Lamentations, remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I will hope in him. Friends, don't be afraid to hope in the midst of your affliction because God never fails. Hope never disappoints. Hope never disappoints. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says, therefore since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom, through him, we've also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, not only that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that the suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who, he, who has been given to us. We, we can hope when it appears as if there is no hope because God never fails. Because hope never disappoints to accomplish God's purpose. And friends, because we're on this side of the cross, we can say something that Job couldn't say. But we can say that Jesus is enough. Now, Job hinted at this in Job chapter 19 and verse 25. Job made that great proclamation. I know that my Redeemer lives and on the earth again shall stand. Now, he didn't know how God was going to bring about his redemption, but he knew that God was his redemption. We know how God brings about our redemption. His name is Jesus. And he is for us. And he showed us what it looks like to suffer. To have the will of God conflict with our will and yet lean into and trust the character and the purpose of God and say, not my will, but yours be done. God, the only way that you can accomplish your glory and fullness is for me to suffer and therefore I will suffer. Friends, it is a truth in Scripture, that the only way that God can bring the glory that he desires to bring to himself in some seasons of our life is in suffering. In your suffering, don't be afraid to hope. Because hope in God in the midst of our suffering stimulates.